morning, congregation of the Lord. It's always a blessing to, to come over this way and the living, to deliver the living oracles of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, I want you guys to keep, keep me and my family in prayer. We've been experiencing a lot of deaths in our family here recently. I just went to my niece's funeral Friday, and my uh, brother-in-law, he was there, just like we have in the congregation here. About 99% of the individuals here are wearing masks. And my brother-in-law, he, he didn't recognize me because I had cut my hair and he hadn't seen me in years and walked up to him and said, hey, how you doing, man? Shook his hand and everything. He said, oh, what's up? And then he looked. He said, man, I'm so tired of all these people wearing their masks. They done lifted all of that and you people still wearing your mask. I said, hey, you got to understand People are just trying to be safe. You know, we're living in a world where life is so uncertain and the destiny of people, the choices that we are making, some choose to come to accepting the gospel and there are those who do not accept the gospel, especially a lot of the people that I have dealt with over the years, uh, people of color, because of this book right here, how that they have said that uh, the uh, white man has used this book in a way that has led many of us astray. But as I tell them, this book is the living oracles of God. It was just in the hands of wicked man that didn't accept the word of the Lord, but used it to their advantage. And now they are paying for it. If they did not repent and accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life. Our text, scriptures that was read in your hearing today, coming out of 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 14 through 16. Paul told Timothy that if I delay, if I tarry long, thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. You see, without controversy, let there be no mistake Godliness was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, received up into glory. What a beautiful thing. The church is the title of our lesson today. The house of God in the Old Testament, the first house of God in the Bible is the one that who saw is the one that Jacob saw when he dreamed and behold a ladder was set up on the earth reading from Genesis chapter 28 verse 12 and verse 17 behold a ladder was set up on the earth and the top of it reached to the heaven and behold the angels of God descending Ascending and descending on it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gateway to heaven. You see, Jacob called this place Bethel, which means the house of God. Many years had passed after Jacob had that dream and Jacob's descendants multiplied in Egypt where they were slaves to Pharaoh 
very far from Bethel. Very far from Bethel. And I suppose that when they were there, they worshipped as the Egyptians did, perhaps, because they could not do the things that they formerly would have done back in Canaan. There they worshipped the gods of Egypt, but God did not forget his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So what God did, according to Exodus chapter 20, I mean chapter 12, he brought them out of Egypt after redeeming them by the blood of the Passover lamb. We just looking at some background here on how the Lord in the term church or the congregation of the Lord was used back in years gone by. You see, his own redeemed, he had delivered his own redeemed. He wanted to dwell among them. So we see that in Exodus chapter 25 and verse 8, God gave them a command to make a sanctuary. And this sanctuary that he instructed them to make was to be one that would be able to move with them throughout their journey. You see, God, as the Lord of his own house, gave minute details concerning the house that they would build. You see, and when we look at Exodus chapter 39 and verse 43, and Moses looked upon all the work, and behold, they had done it as the Lord had commanded. Even so had they done it, and Moses blessed them. You see, at this point in time, the Lord gave them that command to build his habitation for that time because everything was made according to the divine constructions, a cloud covered the tent of the congregation and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And as we read in Exodus chapter 40 and verse 34 and 35, and Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon in the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. See, at this, we see the important lesson for us. Many years had passed by before King Solomon's time when the temple was built in Jerusalem and that became the stationary house of the Lord. It also had to be built exactly according to the divine pattern. As we read in 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 10 and 11, and it came to pass that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand to minister because, the cloud, because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house. You see, Jehovah promised that his eyes will be upon this house as long as his people obeyed him. But as we know, the children of the Lord, of Jehovah, disobeyed and started worshiping gods of the heathens. You see, the house of God in the time of Christ is what we look to now. Although Solomon's temple was built by Zerubbabel, we do not read that the glory of the Lord visited this earth again until that wonderful night in which Christ was born. See, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the fields, keeping watch over their flock. And lo, an angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around about them, and they were very much afraid. And the angel said unto them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good 
tidings of great joy, which will be to all the people. For unto us is born this day in the city of David, a savior who is the Christ, the Lord. Luke chapter two, verses eight through 11. In Colossians chapter one, verses 19, in Colossians chapter two, in verse nine, and in this savior, the fullness of the Godhead was pleased to dwell. But what about the beautiful temple that was present then, which took 40 years to build in the days of King Herod? But Christ said in Matthew chapter 21 and verse 13, Christ described it as a den of thieves this house of God. And he prophesied of its destruction in Matthew chapter 24, verses one and two. During the life of Jesus, it was in him that God was praying. Present on this Christ as a representative of the Father. You see in John chapter 2 and verse 19, his body was the true temple of God. Christ referred to this fact when he said to the Jews, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The true temple of the Lord today is a house that's not built by the hands of man. The house of God in this age. We see in Matthew chapter 16 verses 15 through 16 as they were coming to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, Jesus said to his disciples, who do men say that I, the son of man, is? And Peter answered, some say John the Baptist, some say Jeremiah, some say Elijah, some say one of the prophets. And Jesus said, who do you say that I, the son of man, is? Peter responds, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus says to Peter, blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my father who is in heaven. And here is when he declares what he is about to do. And I also say unto thee that thou art Christ and upon this rock I will build my church. He says, I say unto thee that thou art Peter and upon this rock I will build my church and whatsoever thou shalt bound on earth shall be bound in heaven. But even before that, nothing shall overcome the church. The church will continue to push and press towards eternity. And anything gets in its way, it will get rolled over. This is what we are dealing with in Matthew chapter 16, verses 18. Upon this rock I will build my church, indicating that Christ was still speaking about a future date concerning this matter. You see, in First Timothy, where he says to Peter, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness, for he was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the spirit, seen of angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world. You see, the church is the habitation of the living God. God dwells in the church, the house of God, which is the church of the living God. He is not, it does not just say the house of God. It says the house of the living God, because that what, that's what he is. The church of God does not consist in massive buildings or grandly designed or richly 
decorated as we see some of these buildings of today. But it is a congregation of immortal souls and bodies which are the temple of the living God. See, we must understand that back in Solomon's day and back during the wilderness journeys, certain material was used to build the dwelling place of the Lord. Just as in Solomon's time when they built the temple, it took stones and rocks and things of that nature. But in our time, it is we who are the living stones of the living God. When we come together, we come together as a holy habitation. It's what we must understand. How different from the lifeless idol of Diana when Timothy was left in charge to uh, stand in defense of the congregation in Ephesus. In Ephesus, you see, this these are the Ephesians built a temple that was regarded as one of the seven wonders of the world. And how different the worship and service. You see, God's house must have laws and commandments to be to preserve it from unseemly disorder and irreverence is what we are facing today. The congregation worshiping the living God must have laws and commandments to pre preserve it from faction and anarchy. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ today, according to Revelations chapter 2 and verse 1, he walks amongst the lampstand. Christ present in all of his congregations throughout the world. You see, we have such qualifications in the church of Christ today as in deacons, and elders, and evangelists to make sure that we keep it pure from false teachings and things of that nature to continue to drive forward with the truth. The house of God. Why does he call it that? Why is the church mentioned together with the manifestation of God in the flesh? It is because the church is the house of God. What does this term house God mean? When you look at your own house, when you refer to your house, do you mean the place where you dwell, where where you work out your life, where he lives and, and where he works out his life. The house is none other than the church of the living God. Notice that the term here is not merely God, but the living God. He is living and he dwells in the church. This is where he moves in the church, lives in the church, works out his whole life in the church. So when we say that the church or the house of God, when we say this, do we have a deep realization that God dwells in this house? We must have a deep understanding concerning the house of God, as in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God.
what a great thought of being in the household, in the household of God. We talk about one who has built the universe from nothing. We talk about the one who created man from the dust of the ground and put him to sleep like a surgeon, opened up his side, took a part of him out, sewed it back up or whatever he did with it, and built a woman. And from that woman came population of the world as it is in Christ when the Lord took him Christ gave his life and he went to the center of the earth the unseen three days and when he came forth he came forth as Life that could not conquer him. This church is not only the house of God in which he dwells, lives, and works out his life, but also the pillar and the base of the truth. Got about five more minutes here. This is going to be a continuation of this series concerning this. It's a lot of information to cover. The pillar and the base of the truth. We remember. When uh, Pilate asked uh, Christ this question concerning truth, in John chapter 18, 38, Pilate said to him, what is truth? After he said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I do not find no guilt in him. Christ was sinless. The word truth in such a passage means reality. Now that brings us to a different point. We asked, what is the real thing? What is the real thing? If truth is in actuality reality, then what is the real thing? The real thing is Christ as the reality of everything. The food that you take in, In is not of the real sustenance. It's only a shadow. The real food and water is Christ. If you do not have Christ, you do not have the reality of the food and the water that leads to eternity. Do not have it. You may think that you have human life, that you have is real, but it is not. It too is only a shadow. It is not the real deal. You may think that your human life is real, but it's not the real deal. As we see in Psalms chapter 39 and verse 6, surely a man goes about as a shadow. Surely for nothing they are in turmoil. Man heaps up wealth and does not know who will gather. In John 6 and 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. This is the real food. This is the real water. You see, real life is Christ. St. John chapter 6, verses 22 through 59, you will read that. And in John chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, and this is the testimony that God gave us. We all have a testimony about the life that we have lived. But the true testimony is the testimony that God gave to us. And this is the testimony that God gave us, eternal life, and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. All the types of all the figures, all the shadows in the Old Testament are but pictures of the reality to come, which is Christ himself. Christ is truth. Christ is reality. 
of the whole universe. This is the true reality of the whole universe. Christ is the reality of the Old Testament and also of the New Testament. If you only have the teachings of Christ, you do not have the reality of Christ because many people teach many different things. Christ himself is the truth and his spirit is the spirit of truth. In John chapter 14 and verse 17, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him or knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. It is this fact that makes us the children of God today. In St. John chapter 15 and verse, verse 26, but when the helper comes, he will send, I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. He will bear witness about me. In St. John chapter 16 and verse 13, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth for he will not speak on his own authority or initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. And then finally, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 6. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the spirit is the one who testifies. Why? Because the spirit is the spirit of truth. You see, he himself is the reality. And his spirit is the spirit of reality. The church in which this living God dwells, lives and moves, is the pillar in the base in which the reality stands. This is what we are dealing with. But we are standing for Christ, the reality of truth. So we say to our family members and all of our friends today, come and see the reality of life in the church of Christ, in the body of Christ, in the congregation of the living God and you will see a different worship service than those of the Baptists, those of the Protestants, those of the Methodists, those of our Islam, and all. For Christ came before them all, and his message that he have for us is for all eternity. You do yourself harm when you deny the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, but you do yourself justice when you say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. Therefore, when you make that confession, you make it before the brothers and sisters that sit before you and you make it before the heavens and we will take you and we will baptize you into the body of Christ because today we need a new blood. Today, we need a new mind. Today, we need a better understanding than the human blood that we have. We need the blood of Christ to cover us from all of the things that defile us. You see, the reality of love is in Christ. The reality of patience is in Christ. In the reality of many other things, what is patience? Ask yourself, what is patience? And I will tell you, patience is Christ. Patience is Christ living within me and through me and through every individual that come to Christ. Everything that we need, patience, humility, kindness, the love for others, and even love for God must be found in Christ. That is my message for us today. I will pick up and continue this lesson at a later date, if it be the Lord's will. But if you stand in need of prayer, we are here to pray for you. If you are one who is here and have not obeyed the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you have an opportunity to do so today because God says in through uh, Luke in the book of Acts, you know, God adds to the church daily such as should be saved. May God have a blessing on 
all of his congregations throughout the land and on his word. Thank you.